I just knew that this was a story that needed to be told because it shows not only the PTSD struggle of Jackson himself, but how we as a society have still failed to help people with who who are working through mental trauma and, and struggles. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast. If you're looking to hear stories of hope, inspiration, and turning your greatest adversities into your advantage, well, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Jason Lachance, and through my addiction recovery and struggles with anxiety and depression, I dug into my passion of speaking with people who have transformed their lives. And my guest is Alexander Rendazzo, writer and actor. His film, Lonesome Soldier, in which he wrote and stars in, is based on a true American story of a lonesome soldier. It follows the life of Jackson Harlow. Jackson was a young dreamer, ended up becoming a haunted war veteran, suffering from PTSD, struggled with substance abuse and addiction. And the film isn't just about the effects that it took upon Jackson himself, but also his family and community. And I think this is subject matter that we don't really talk about enough. The film is phenomenal. I got to watch it. I was in tears, incredibly moved. It's so well done. You're going to enjoy this conversation and please check out the movie. I've got the links in the podcast description so you can find out more about Lonesome Soldier as well as Alexander. Trust me, you will not regret seeing Lonesome Soldier. It is a phenomenal movie. We get into all of the work that Alex put into developing the film and the character itself. You'll be mind blown at the depths that he took himself to make sure that he portrayed the character of Jackson Harlow and did it justice, as well as creating a film that depicts the hardships that families face when soldiers return and suffer from PTSD, substance abuse, and more. Welcome into Knocking Doors Down, Alexander Rendazzo. Thanks for joining me today. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. I, well, you know, we had a mutual friend of ours that uh, he was like, hey, I, I met this actor and he's he's, you know, wrote starring in this movie right up your alley. And and of course, it's about, um, you know, a soldier suffering with PTSD. And it's uh, one of the very near and dear heart near and dear to my heart topics of, um, yeah, just our service men and women coming home and, and no support. So, yeah, I had to talk to you. Of course, the phone, the film. um Lonesome Soldier. It's uh, yeah, we'll get into that. But <laughs> before I start getting emotional and off that track, three things you're grateful for today, Alex. Three things I am grateful for. I am grateful for uh, being alive. I'm grateful that it is a beautiful day. I just went for a lovely walk um, a little bit ago in nature, listening to the birds still chirping down here in North Carolina. It hasn't gotten too cold yet. And I'm grateful for just such an amazing support group of friends and family through through this process um and it's been a six and a half year process a lot of ups and downs and we'll get into that later but my family and close friends they have never left my side never stopped encouraging me and that uh definitely definitely top three things right now that i'm grateful for and then obviously fourth to be talking to you <laughs> well hey i'm high on everyone's gratitude list so <laughs> uh wait north carolina you do not sound like you're from north carolina my friend well that uh that's because number one i'm an actor if, if you haven't noticed but um no i i grew i grew up here till i was about 12 then wow. i traveled the entire country uh, one state a month for 10, st 10 months a year out of for five years on a hockey trip with my family. And then I moved to L.A. I've been there um, for the last six or seven years. And then I swap between here and out between North Carolina and L.A. So kind of a little bit from everywhere. All right. Well, you, I was thinking more of a, a an upstate uh, accent. A little Minnesota in there. That's where my folks relocated. So I, that might be a little bit, a little bit of where that twang comes from. All right. Yeah. Cause I always get people, where are you from Te originally? I'm like California. And you sound like you're from Texas. No, I'm not from fucking Texas. I'm from California. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, before we dig into a uh, lonesome soldier, some of those challenges there and why it was so important for you to tell the story. I kind of want to know a little bit more about yours. I mean, you know, like you said, some of the hockey life, you got acting, you're, you're in two different locations. Like where did, what was Alex the kid like? 
Oh, yeah. What was Alex the Kid like? So I grew up, obviously, like I said, down here in North Carolina. When I was 12, I remember 11 or 12, I remember reading a book that my mom got me for Christmas that I finished it and I was like, this reads like a movie script. My, my dad is a world renowned hockey coach um, and he was a former special forces army ranger. Um, my my mother was into the arts, into acting and, and, and all of that. So dad made sure we played sports, which we are all very competitive. I got four younger siblings and man, it uh, we go at it when we're when, over Thanksgiving dinner. Um, <laughs> And then mom always made sure we were into acting and all that. So I just one day at 11 went on a went on my mom's computer, called up the author, this best-selling author, found his home phone number on page 98 of Google um, and asked if I could make a movie of his book. And he said yes. And over the next couple of years, I wrote and directed and starred in this little couple thousand dollar movie that I raised some money for and and from there, really dove into hockey and played hockey for for the next five or six years. Played junior hockey uh, all over. Um, ended up breaking both my ankles and my wrist, and was like, "All right, I'm done." I always wanted to be an actor anyway. So from there, I moved to L.A. and here we are. I'll be damned. Well, and I I find it so interesting you know hockey players to me and all my experience with different athletes i was primarily baseball basketball did some track and field but like hockey's a whole nother breed of of athlete like i mean because just the athleticism the hand-eye coordination like i tried ice skating alex i fell on my fucking head every time you know so it's uh it's an insane sport, and I and I and it's one of those that I think even to be proficient, you have to be at a high level, which I think varies f- from some other sports potentially. Absolutely, yes it 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 is definitely not something you know anyone can pick up a, a glove and a baseball. Not to pick on baseball, but it's not that diff. It, you you got to know how to run and swing a bat and throw and catch a ball. In, in hockey, you got to skate on little thin you know, blades at 30, 40 miles an hour and not get your bell rung like you're playing football while chasing around this tiny little black biscuit thing. And it uh, it definitely is a very, it's very intense. It's definitely an adrenaline rush. Um, and it's, it. Uh, I, I loved every second of playing it, but at the same time, I don't think I've played since probably in four or five years. So. My body just couldn't take it. Yeah. <laughs> Understandable, man. I'm I'm I was an okay basketball player and at 45, my knees are done. So I understand. Did you feel though that you were able to translate be it either the discipline and or some skill sets or both into when you were like, hey, I'm really gonna pursue acting because you didn't screw around. You're like I'm just picturing, hey mom, dad, I'm done with hockey. I'm pursuing acting. By the way, I'm moving to LA. Like, cause that's the big, bold move that most people aren't willing to take hand up. Absolutely. It, it, the, the self-discipline and work ethic and commitment that is ingrained in all sports at a high level, but especially in hockey definitely is one of the primary reasons why I'm sitting here talking to you today about a film and that that translates in all areas of life and relationships and friendships and in, you know, in the in work and in, in, in the entertainment industry and playing board games with my family. Like, it's just the intensity and the, the dedication that we all learned growing up from playing hockey uh, definitely has carried over into pretty much every aspect of my life. Absolutely. Well, and I think it it lends to, you know, <clears throat> and I'm sure with the with Lonesome Soldier, you know, there's some uncomfortable situations that you as an actor and, and even you stepping in as as a writer of this, um, that you know you're gonna put that character in and being able to endure it. I think that's some of the things that some people may not understand about the acting process is the willingness to step into some real discomfort and have to endure it. Um, you know, I did a student film in college. I had to play a synchronized swimmer. They're like, the pool's going to be heated. 
No, this was November in Monterey, California. The pool was not heated. It was about 55 degrees and we're in that thing for two hours straight. So, you know, it's oh, like, I know that for sure. We had a, there's a scene at boot camp in Lonesome that we shot at night and it was supposed to be during the summer. And we were shooting in, in March in New Mexico, in the desert and in tank tops. And it was probably, I believe it was 37 degrees. And we were out there for eight hours. Like it was a similar, same exact situation as you in the pool. Man. <laughs> oh. I'll never uh -oh. forget. Feeling. I, I spent my whole life in an ice rink and I've never felt more cold than when I went. <laughs> right? Yeah, that you got the pads and the sweater and all the, you know, the jersey and everything. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you get a lot out of this podcast, share with a friend. And don't forget the archive of interviews we have. Bam Margera, Brandon Novak, Kat Von D, Charlie Sheen, Edward Furlong, Kelly Osborne. The list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives. Speaking of purpose, how about a lifestyle brand with purpose? 5150 LTM. That's right, not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life, but they give back to the community. And you, the listener of Knocking Doors Down, get 20% off every time you shop at 5150LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. Their three amazing programs, the race to end the stigma, the race for autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. You shared about your father being special forces, like, hey, those anyone that's special forces is a gnarly individual. They just are like, wow. Um, but why was it really important for you to tell this story? You know, it's based on an individual. The character's name is Jackson Harlow. But, you know, this was pulled from a real story of a real individual post-service really struggling with PTSD. Why personally did you really want to tell this story? Well, I got connected to the real life mother uh, right around when I moved to LA and I just continued. And the more I talked to her and I talked to the real life Jackson, I just knew that this was a story that needed to be told because it shows not only the PTSD struggle of Jackson himself, but how we as a society have still failed to help people with who, who are working through mental trauma and, and struggles and, you know, just take these pills and take these meds and, and don't get yourself in trouble. And that, between falling in love with with the, the the real life family and just feeling a passion to tell their story because of how much it moved me, it also speaks to a broader sense of I want to make projects that help change change the culture and change the world for good. And this definitely had the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you being in L.A., uh, I mean, I'm sure you see it. What where we're at with the a mental health crisis, a housing crisis, and especially a drug crisis, you know, that we're going to have, uh, you know, I was just at uh, the last episode before this one talking with a gentleman who was in the Navy, Jason Howe, and he works uh, now after his addiction, struggling with his PTSD and TBI, uh, training canines to, to mm. help veterans. And it's, it's just, um, I mean, I, I'm sure you going through parts of LA, I'm more in a rural area, but I still see it of what this mental health and drug crisis is, is just doing to our country. It's, it's sad. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's, it's inhuman. It, it really is. It really is. And, and it, when you drive around LA, I remember even just in six, in the last six years, there'd be maybe one homeless tent under every bridge. Now there's probably 20 to 30 um under every bridge and it just it is so so tragic and instead of instead of just kind of ignoring it it's the same thing with our vets our veterans with ptsd 
we we've just turned for so long we've turned a blind eye and we just ignore it and it's not our problem it's somebody else's and the problem if it hasn't already it will very soon become everyone's problem mm-hmm. and I, I i i say I, you're absolutely right it's it, i make the parallel with what we're doing now with how we focus on those struggling with addiction that are out there on the street it's like well, they're just out there on the street. It's fine. And we're going to give them safe supply so they don't get AIDS and, and hepatitis and all. Like, look, I don't want anyone either. But if you're letting them be out there to get their drugs and snorting, shooting, smoking fentanyl, eventually, after yeah, maybe two years max, you're going to have to find a graveyard for thousands and thousands of people. As this yeah. year will probably approach 130,000, of which I know there's a good percentage are our veterans and first responders. Yes. Yeah. Now that's that's a very good point of you can put a band-aid on a bullet wound only for so long until you still bleed out. It's uh and and I it it fascinates me how especially with the homeless with the 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 homeless drug situation especially in California how we would rather instead of take the same money that we're giving safe needles and, and safe drug paraphernalia to help them. We could be using that money to build, you know, rehab centers and in housing. And, and it, it, it just seems upside down and backwards to me. Oh, it is. And, and there seems to, you know, because I work in it, there seems to be an absolute refusal for, you know, to work with the private sector in it. Be like, yes. hey, what can we do? How can we work together? How can we really tackle this? And, uh, you know, sadly, end of the day, then comes down to money, re-elections, yeah. ego, politics. And it's sad because it's people's life. And I mean, we see it. I mean, your subject matter of your film is about it. Like our vets deserve better than this when they come home. And I know yeah. the VA is is underfunded oh you know understaffed and they're you know so i'm not ta attacking that but it's like boy we could we need some more help here absolutely i mean even just even cutting down like like you said working with the private sector how can the military as they cycle guys out men and women out of of the service, how can they cycle them in into the private sector instead of just telling them good luck? And, and it's it goes back to your point earlier that it it comes down to money and ego and reelections and at the end of the day, a false sense of empathy where mm. you can say whatever you want in front of the cameras and in a podium, but at the end of the day, nobody actually cares enough to do something about it. And the the very few that do, it's it's you know it's uh, a grain of sand trying to fight a, a a tidal wave. How did you prep yourself to step into the character of Jackson Harlow? I mean, it's a it's just challenging enough to pull off the military side. You know, I've had friends that have worked, you know, in that, and it's the intense training there. But let alone, you know, you're not just doing this. isn't a This isn't a war film. This is a about an individual who faced war and then came home, and you're having to really step into what that is. Like, what are some of the challenges that you, that you really faced as an actor to to do it justice? I mean, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I I mean, the first obstacle was coming to terms with the idea that people that are veterans who suffer from PTSD are not weak. They're not pussies. That that was something that took me growing up with with a badass father and not that, you know, nothing bad about my father, but what he, he never struggled with any of that. And mm -hmm. he was this big, tough guy that was my role model and still is my role model to this day. But seeing that and how he came out versus people coming back and all oh, I had to shoot my gun. I grew up going, well, you just are, are mentally weak. You're a mentally weak sure. person. And it wasn't until I started meeting, I probably met with a dozen, two dozen veterans over the course of the last couple of years in both writing and preparing for the role that I started to learn and realize that 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 was that 
assumption is completely wrong. These guys are actually still the toughest of the tough. And whether it's a chemical reaction to a fight or flight high stress mode, or whether it's the overwhelming guilt that no one else will ever feel unless you are pulling the trigger or watching a friend of yours die in front of you. Um, that well, I had to wrap my head around that. Um, I, I spent a lot of time, like I said, with different veterans from all over, from infantry guys and to and enlisted guys, Vietnam, uh, war on terror, uh, all the way to you know officers and special forces guys, just hearing different people's stories and the stories that nobody ever talks about. It's an interesting thing I found that whether you're an author or whether you're an actor, if you sit down one on one and you buy somebody a beer, they're going to tell you something. They're going to tell you things that they're never going to they're not going to tell really anyone else um, mm -hmm. in order to help you in order to help me in my performance. So I spent a lot of time doing that. I had a journal about this thick that I would just I would journal over the years of these different stories and. I mean, some of them are, I mean, they all are pretty horrific. Um, and then being a method actor, I went out to New Mexico where we filmed a month early and I got rid of my phone. I got a 2005 flip phone because that's when the film takes place. And it had three numbers. It had my therapist, my grandma and the director. And that was it. And I lived for 30 days as Jackson uh, in this, in the house that Jackson lives in the film. Um, and all I did was work out and drive myself crazy. And then we put it on film and we shot the film. Thankfully, it was very therapeutic. We shot it backwards. So we started with all the crazy PTSD stuff. And then by the end of the film, it's, he's young, he's happy, he's joyful before he joins the military. And that, if we hadn't done it that way, I think I probably would have gone a lot more crazy afterward because it helped me start at the top and I drove myself, you know, I, I pretty much put myself through the ringer, whether that's with, with alcohol or staying up and not eating for days on end or walking the streets, doing all of those things for a month and, and then being able to put that on camera and then wind myself down from it in a very healthy manner uh, was, was kind of my method for performing this. Knocking Doors Down by Carlos Vieira, now available wherever you get audiobooks. I wasn't done partying and I didn't want the binge to end. I think I knew that when I finally got home, I'd have to face what I had done and I wasn't ready to do that. Being responsible for my actions wasn't something I was looking forward to. I had abandoned my wife and baby, my family, and my business. I wanted to avoid the shame of returning to what I had left behind. Even though I was not yet going home, I wasn't sure I had enough resources to continue the binge. Click the link in the podcast description to find out more. We've heard this with so many different actors. I always love the... Um, oh. I'm blanking on the actor right now, but, you know, he laid in a bath of ice so that he could understand. And another actor went, you, you do know it's called acting, right? You yes, can pretend uh, to be cold. Uh, Dustin, Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman. Yes. Yeah. I studied Dustin Hoffman. He's he's definitely one of my my role models for for acting and the the lengths that he went. And then I believe it was Alec Guinness uh, who played Obi-Wan Kenobi, the old yeah. Obi-Wan and old Star Wars. He goes, it is called acting. Yeah. And, but no, that kind of takes the fun away from it. <laughs> uh, so then let me ask you, A, were you afraid, like, or was there any trepidation of stepping into this process? And B, I mean, before we got rolling, hey, you're in a committed relationship. It's heading towards all the great things. Like, was there also the fear with your family? I'm sure it takes a toll to step into that kind of role especially if you're giving yourself a month leeway. Absolutely. It, it, the family one was, was pretty tough to start um, with, with my close friends and family. And, and they, it was, 
a lot more tough for them, I think, than it was for me. I, I made sure that that I had someone, uh, I had the director or my therapist, uh, and then my grandma was was the only one in my family who had the the phone, the, my flip phone number, and she'd call me and talk, hey, Jackson, and, and I was, you know, referring to Jackson, but they, I know they struggled with it a lot more than I did mm. um, because I was very – folk back to that hockey dedication I was focused in. Um, but to, to everyone on the outside, it kind of, and it, it's pretty crazy. You're, 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 <laughs> living, you're living the life of someone else. And, and I, I, I can see my mom just sitting there scratching her head going, well, I think my son might need to be institutionalized. He's out of his fucking mind. <laughs> um, but that for me, the fear, I definitely was concerned about the difficulty of getting out of it when we were done. I was I was not concerned with putting myself through the ringer when we started, but I was very scared and concerned uh, once we finished. How long was it going to take for me to find Alex again and come back to Alex. And, and so after we finished filming, I drove to a small, a tiny town in Utah, um, which is kind of my, my happy place. And I, I lived, I lived there for a week, week and a half, just by myself, just processing through and working out. And by the end of that, I was pleasantly surprised that it did not take as much from me or as long to get out of playing Jackson. But the other interesting thing along that lines was, you know, we all have trauma. I I've had uh, a lots of ups and downs over my life, but I've had some pretty seriously traumatic things. Um, excuse me, pretty serious traumatic experiences in my own personal life. And I always was told by acting coaches and and people in Hollywood that don't work through it with therapy now, hold on to it and then use it for your performance and it will bring it back up, use it for your performance, and then it will be therapeutic and also make your performance better. So when I came out of Jackson, I had pulled all of these traumatic things that I had never worked on or worked through during the performance, but there was no therapy. So I'm just left sitting there in Utah going, well, shit, now I need to find a new therapist. Um, Cause it really <laughs> didn't, it really did not accomplish what I was hoping it to accomplish. And then I was just left with all this un unresolved trauma from my, yeah. my childhood. So, Yeah. Well, and, and I would think, you know, when you're sitting there, you know, like before we started recording, talking about my alcoholism, like I'm when you were talking about that and then the isolation, the roaming the streets that to me, it was, uh, I think, the most fascinating part that you said you went and continue to isolate. Like, I know for me, if I even, you know, stepped into that kind of challenge of a role that you've written and, and performed uh, like it would scare the shit out of me. That would be the hardest thing, that lack of community. I mean, it's so, it's vital. It's 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 one of the biggest things that we are seeing with a lot of the soldiers, that they're not speaking open. There isn't any group collective coming together like, you know, hey, me too, brother, and I'm, you know. And to me, that's really frightening. Yeah, I think I think there there's a difference between, uh, and you make a good point, and I've never thought of it that way, I am an introvert at heart, even mm. though, even though I, you know, an extroverted introvert or whatever it's called. Yeah, same. And so that that kind of just going and spending time alone to to heal and process through is is what I I usually always do every year on my birth or right around my birthday. I will go to a cabin in the woods for a weekend by myself and just process through where I'm at with life. It's just kind of how I've always you know, hand conducted myself. So that part didn't scare me. Plus during the, the month and a half of filming, we I'm surrounded or Jackson was surrounded by 50 to a hundred people on a day-to-day -day basis that were still there to support Jackson. Now it wasn't supporting Alex, but I still found that sense of community 
through Jackson um, while filming and then needed to get away from that too. So it's, it's an interesting, like I said, I've never thought I'm going to have to think I'm going to have to ponder that one a little more and I'll get back to you on that. Cause I've never, that's an, yeah, that's an interesting one. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it blew my mind there a little bit, Jason. Uh, I, but I I can relate to what you're saying, an extroverted introvert. So I I naturally tend to be introspective and look at myself before I look outward for what is the life struggle. Like I, you know, especially through my recovery, the 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 victim mentality is just gone. You know, yeah. like, like I told you, going through sexual abuse as a kid, like. I no longer let those occurrences victimize me. Like, so now I look introspective, like, hmm, my life's not going the way I want it. What am I not doing? I don't go, oh, well, it was the neighbor or my partner or my kids or my job or my, you know, it's like, huh, what can I do? Like, as simple as I don't like my income level. Oh, wait, I got some extra work now. There you go. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, just like what? How can I improve? Okay, I, I got in a fight with my significant other. How how can I improve myself? She might still be a part of the factor, you know. She might be a part of the equation, but I'm the. I can only, I can only at the end of the day be held responsible for myself and improve myself. Yeah. And and so I think that's kind of what you're saying of of being on that introspective level there. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it, 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 it does start with us, like everything in our life, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll counsel, you know, some young newcomers and they'll be like, man, I just, I went through another relationship and all right, tell me about the last one, dude, you had the same fucking relationship in a row, just different people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know what's wrong with these people. Da, 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 da. It's your picker. It's uh, you. Uh, it's not them. It's you. You change you. You're going to find something different, attractive. It's how it works. That's what I, uh, when I write scripts, I have a group of uh, 10 or 11 readers that, that will always read my scripts when I finish and they'll give me notes. And I, I have come to find out that when eight, nine, 10, 11 people are all telling me I something's wrong and I disagree. It's usually not the one person who's right. Usually you're the one person in the wrong if eight or nine other people are telling you otherwise. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and, we, and, the, I, and I think that comes with age and, and checking ego, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Ego ego and insecurity go hand in hand because I've found the more insecure someone is in who they are, their ego it acts as a defense mechanism. And then the more, if you're too secure in who you are, your ego turns into kind of a cocky pridefulness. And so there's a, a very important balance there. Yeah. And it has to be a, a constant check and balance, I think. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How do you navigate that being in, you know, in Hollywood? You have big aspirations. Uh, you know, I know some folks down there and it's like, oh, geez. Uh, it, it's a tough it's a tough climate. I mean, just in the world in general now, but let alone that climate of that industry. Yeah, I I am blessed. Like I shared uh, three things I'm grateful for. I am blessed with such an amazing support group that whether it be my my grandmother, my nana, uh, whether it be my girlfriend or whether it be a couple of my best friends, if I ever came off as a cocky prick, my grandma would fly down from Buffalo and kick my ass. Um, <laughs> so for me, I oh. I am ask people knowing that things are just going to continue to get crazier and crazier in this industry and in life i have been honest and and humble with a select few group of people in my inner circle and said listen do not let me be do not let me become that cocky prick please if 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 you guys see me starting to to you know, that, that ego balance, if that ego starts to raise, then we need to have, you know, people have interventions for drugs or drinking. We need to have an ego intervention. 
Um, and then prayer, personally, a lot of prayer. I'm very spiritual uh, as a Christian, and I spend a lot of time uh, talking to to the man upstairs one on one. And and if you don't humble yourself, I've found he he will humble you real quick. Uh, so those are definitely probably the two biggest factors, um, especially right now with the wow, the wow factor in in this being kind of my first big film. I'm I'm in, still in shock and awe the, that ego hasn't really. I haven't even really had any issues with it yet because I still don't really. I'm not processing everything that's going on with mm. the film coming out in, in theaters in less than two weeks and I'm signing autographs and I'm doing this and that. And I'm kind of like, you know, in like GTA or, or the video games where your guy's drunk and everything's kind of cloudy. <laughs> I feel like that, like right now, it's just very <laughs> surreal. Uh, well, you know what? You dropped two really cool things there, Alex, that, um, that you brought up is like for us recovery people, the, the the most imperative thing that we that has been successful is connectivity to a group that checks you. Primarily, then you have a sponsor in the group and a higher power. Two Absolutely. greatest things that have worked for anyone in recovery. And so, for you to just have those principles in life, it really does. I, I mean, I can relate with certain things. Like, I can't think of anything recently but i've definitely had people like dude don't like don't be a prick i'm like am i like can you tell but tell me why don't just tell me i am yeah. tell me why let's get a little dialogue and examine because i i don't want to be you know and i kind of have to i have to check it a little bit too because all right i'm hey i'm a weird fucking dude all right i'm just i'm weird i mean we're talking i got Pinkish I, red I, I hair. couldn't tell once I saw your hair. I, yeah. I, I could I didn't I couldn't tell that at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, so I, I, people might think I, you know, oh, you do that because whatever attention, and I guess it does get attention, but it's like I get bored. It's better than me going back out drinking or whatever else it is. So if I just kind of do this stuff that my partner enjoys and you know we have fun with, then I'm like well, I don't know. So yeah. sometimes it's that balance too of of perception of others. So it's it's hard to, you know. I I asked my I I asked my grandmother this a couple of days ago because I I have a a personal. I was just in L.A. for three days. I I think I got two or three hours of sleep a night because just from five in the morning phone calls on with people on the East coast to sitting in the, the sound studio. Cause we were finishing the sound for the film, then meetings about the end credits, then traveling around and doing all these different things. We brought on a personal assistant. That's going to be um, working with me here for the next month to two months. And I, I remember I called my grandma the other day going, grandma, does that make me, you know, a a a prideful you know a pride does that make does that increase that ego like should i be feeling bad oh uh, uh, and she goes alex well what's the purpose behind it because if people people if you have an assistant are going to think you're an arrogant asshole whether you <laughs> are or not <laughs> but if the purpose is to make sure that in between my 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., my 9.45 to 10.15, and my 10 to 10.30 meeting that all, you know, three different meetings that take place overlapping, if you need someone who can just make sure you're getting a salad and some water, that's different than going, oh, I got an assistant and talk to my assistant. And I thought right. that was very wise of her. And I think that goes along with the perception as well as checking myself of, okay, how, how can I still remain as, as humble and down to earth as possible while also capitalizing on an opportunity and people's perceptions, especially people who aren't in my inner, who aren't in the inner circle, Christian Bale has a great he has a great quote where he says, if you have a problem with me, pick up the phone and call me. If you don't have my number, fuck off. <laughs> um, and 
And I think that's, I think that goes along with what you're saying. Yeah. Well, and, and people do that so often in a day and age when, you know, with social media or whatever it is, I mean, my big saying trademarked, uh, no outside solutions to inside problems. And, you know, we do so much comparing what we feel inside to what we see outside. And you know it within the industry, like I've had it when I go and speak to kids. I'm like, all right, I'm going to show you this photo. Okay, see this model on this yacht? She doesn't own this yacht. Her manager doesn't own this yacht. It was a buddy of his. He said, I'll give you a little bit of gas if we can have it for a couple hours. Yeah. They sold you on that they're out on the cruise and having a good time. No. It's it's so don't compare what the story you tell yeah. yourself about yourself to what you think is going on with somebody else, because there's some real miserable people that take really good photos and videos. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it Most most of those people that at least I've interacted with when you live above your means. You, you're you're going to end up miserable if you work your butt off and you keep working and you make some money and then one day you can you if you're a model and you get booked on a yacht great if you make enough money to buy a yacht good for you but if you're just going to a friend of a fa- a favor from a favor from a friend of a friend to just show the world and act like it i then you you probably live a very miserable life yeah yeah do you find it the for you in certain moments to maintain authenticity? Yes and no. Okay. It It is very easy for me to put up a very defensive front to any, any time I'm in an uncomfortable situation where I don't know I, I don't, I'm not close with people. Like, like I kept, kept talking about this inner circle. When I go to Los Angeles, I've got four or five of my best friends that when I'm with them, whether we're out at a bar or whether at, at, at in somebody's living room watching football, there is never an issue with authenticity. If I'm at a bar or at a meeting without any backup, anyone having my back, then you know we call it producer Alex is the saying that that we have in, in in my group of when I'm producer Alex oh you know I'm a I'm a succession character and mm. and it's not a fun guy to be around it's not a fun guy to be um I struggle with it a lot but it is a very very uh it's a very very solid defense mechanism that at least at this point in my life seems to be warranted at the start of my career in this business, but it's definitely something that is completely inauthentic and I'm not a fan of it. Um, just being honest and, and raw with you. No, I appreciate that. And I, and I think I would like to maybe, maybe toss this around in your head. The question is I can relate to you in the sense that I tend to be a genuinely empathetic person, very loving, very caring. But sometimes when I have, let's say, like, yeah, God, two, three months ago, this newcomer to uh, celebrate recovery and the kid had overdosed five days prior, twice in one day on fentanyl. And it's like afterwards, it's like, dude, where's your mom? Uh, uh, I don't know. She's picking you up, right? I th- think he was just 19. And I'm like, yeah. And I go out, ma'am, here two boxes of narcan you need to have this and, he's, and he's, he had like this attitude and it's like dude you're gonna die like you're gonna die you know the normal inside me might be like well look buddy you know you gotta understand but he just needs someone to go look i don't want you to fucking die i care about you i want to be that one person that you yeah. understand and and so i think we gotta i think maybe it's just one of the hats regardless of not wanting to wear it doesn't mean it's totally inauthentic it just means, okay, I got to step over there in certain parts of my personality. I got a shelf, which, which, hey, I can relate. It sucks, but yeah, yeah, and and I think it. I wish it, and I'm working on it because I do think it's something that there are certain times that you need to have those defense mechanisms in place, but you still have to remain authentic to who you are. Um even when you're putting kind of putting that shield on or whatever, 
And I have not found that balance yet personally. I'm still working on it. Yeah. Um, although I think even just admitting that on a podcast is probably a very positive step <laughs> forward. <laughs> I, even, I just thought of that. Uh, Solving problem. Do we want to talk about the childhood trauma? I could probably help you. Um, no, it, it it is. I think it's just that struggle with with any of us in life, especially for people that want to be self aware. Like you're saying, you know, you use those things in your craft. It's a part of honing and building that craft, craft planting roots in that craft and growing it out. You know and uh, I got a buddy of mine, Hick Sheremy, down in Louisiana, down in Dubai, you big build it up guy. And, uh, you know, in recovery, and he's talked about that where he's had roles where, you know, he's he's been able to jump back to those memories. And it's not that he hasn't fully processed it because he's like, if you sit with him, he's just like, dude, like, are you sure that like Jesus isn't currently channeling through you right now? Because he's just got <laughs> he's got the, that aura, even when you talk to him virtually like this. Um, but he still has that ability to go and access that stuff, recall it, remember, know how to use it, the feelings that he had, the way his body felt, whatever it is. And it's a, it's a tough craft. I think that's why we see a lot of actors spin out sometimes. Cause you really got to sit in that stuff at times. It's, I had a friend, I had a, a former friend of mine when I first started in, in Los Angeles, who we were talking one day, and this is a few years back, about what separates everyone who wants to be a professional actor and those who who make it, and not even making it like an A-list celebrity, but just those who are able to make a living in in acting. And I I... I said something along the lines of as artists and as actors and as writers, we have to be the one or two percent of people who are willing to go through, relive, and then recreate, go through, relive, and recreate what the 98% of the rest of society doesn't. That dark place that nobody wants to go to, that's where we need to go every day. And it's definitely, that's what I I think separates, again, the, the, the great actors uh, of our time and, the, and any, everyone else who just moves out, who is just talented, who starred in their high school play. And there's nothing wrong against that, but you really have to be able to go where no one else wants to go. And that's what sets, sets people apart. In my opinion. I agree. I, um, I, Brian Cranston's book. Yeah. That's what the one I was reading. He was talking about a scene in uh, breaking bad. Why am I forgetting the actress's first name, last name Ritter anyways, where she's overdosing on heroin. Yes. And he, yeah, and he Christy, lets... or, is it Christine or Christy Ritter or Kylie Ritter? Now I'm looking idiot i might get in trouble now <laughs> right what well, one of the I, yeah and i'm just i can see your face i'm just forgetting the first name but he talked about when he was doing that scene that he pictured it being his daughter mm. Mm. you know and that's what put him into that to be able to react that way and it was like oh shit i couldn't imagine like one of my kids like thinking about that but at the same time after that I hit pause. It was audio book. And I, and I started to feel those same things. I was like, yeah, I don't want to feel this anymore right now. I, I don't even want to have yeah. this thought. I'm going to put on some heavy metal or prints or something to take my mind away from this yep. thought. And I, it just like, yeah, sitting in that. And then a director going, Hey, we're, we're going to need to refocus here. We're going to need to move the lighting a little bit. We're going to need you to do that again. And then asking that of you 10, 12 times. Well, that's, that's there's a scene in uh, Meet Joe Black uh, with Anthony Hopkins and Brad Pitt. I don't know if you ever saw Meet Joe Black, um, yeah. where uh, Anthony Hopkins has to act out a heart attack. And Anthony Hopkins went to the director and said, you get two takes, so don't F it up. If you F it up and within after number two. You're going to have to kill me some different. You're going to have to find a different way for me to die because 
he had to channel having a heart, basically almost having a heart attack and Anthony Hopkins being a, one of the great method actors. Well, he's a stylized method. He's a, he is, is a, he's very interesting, but that's another conversation, but he couldn't put his body through that more than twice. Otherwise he was concerned he would trigger a heart attack. Right. And so there are times, for example, in, in Lone in Lonesome Soldier, there's a, 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 a very, very heavy PTSD freakout scene um, where where Jackson is losing his mind. And we shot all the way up to that, to where he starts smashing shit and breaking shit and losing and, and really going nuts. Uh, and I went to the director and I said, hey, we are doing this once. I'm giving it to you once. Um, and and we got it. Well, we got it in one time versus what you were saying with, you know, like Cranston. Like, I definitely think there are some some performances in some situations on set and in films that the level of darkness and depth that it takes warrants going to the director and saying, Hey, I can't do this more than three times or five times. And that is generally respected in the industry. It's a, um, but anyway, so I, I went on a tangent there. No, but, that's uh, please. This is a great tangent. That's what I enjoy about conversation with folks. And um, with the instance you're talking about in lonesome soldier, how were you then when they call cut? Uh, the scene ends with, I, I, Oh, um, do you even recollect? I, storm, I vaguely recollect. I barely recollect any of filming at all. Um, I do. I do get kind of bits and pieces. I believe I stormed out of the door because it takes place inside and I think I just walked, I just stormed out and I probably walked out for probably 20, 30 minutes and then walked back. Um, I just left and then came back 20, 30 minutes later. Um, I do remember there's a, the most, I can't even watch. There's a different scene in the film, um, which involves a spoiler, but the, the the main guy finds out something and it involves someone very close to him when he's um, back from Iraq. And and I remember walking out because the scene ends with me walking out the door again. A lot of the scenes end with me walking out a door. I don't know. <laughs> um, you you wrote it. Why, why does it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would walk out of the door and slam the door behind me. And then as soon as I heard cut over the radio would just scream at the top of my lungs. Cause the scene was so heartbreaking for me. Mm. Um, I think we did it three or four times and I was able to watch this scene one time when we finished editing it and I have never watched it again. I can't, I just can't even it's, it's one of the most heaviest, um, yeah, it's 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 really it's little things like that that are 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 pretty pretty heavy and pretty powerful. Mm. So you stretched yourself a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, damn man. Uh, well, I'm glad you sent me the screener because I'm popping yeah, that. That absolutely. Where where on. are you located? Because I might be able to get you tickets to the theater near you here. I'm in Central California, so about an hour north of Fresno, California, south of Modesto. We're going to be in Fresno, so we're going to have a screen. We're going to have, starting November 3rd, um, tickets Tickets are on sale now. We're, we're in theaters all across the country. We're definitely going to be in Fresno, so um, we'll, we'll connect about that afterward. Yeah, hell yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to throw out there and really kind of let people know about the movie before we step into a, a, this is what I call a let's have some fun period. Absolutely. One last thing here, especially with your audience, this film lonesome soldier is, is a, is a very powerful true story that we had, we chose to make to support veterans and, 
and their families, and as well as educate the civ- uh, educate civilians. Uh, there hasn't been a PTSD film in a long time that puts you in the shoes of the veteran. We've had people throw up in screenings. We've had people walk out. We've had breakdowns in screenings. It's a very, very heavy, heavy film. And so I want to make that disclaimer, even though I hope it is as successful and viewed by as many people as possible so we can help our our service men and women and our veterans. Uh, I also, we are doing a initiative called Buy a Vet a Ticket similar to what Sound of Freedom did of Pay It Forward, Sound of Freedom this last summer. We are working with Vet Ticks, um, and you you can buy. They have over 2.5 million certified veterans in their system, and you can, if you go see the film and you like the film, or even if you don't want to see the film but you want to support uh, our, our veterans, you can actually pay it forward and veterans can go to vet ticks and claim tickets for free to go see the film so we're pretty excited about that right on uh that link will be in the description so for anyone watching listening make sure you click it and 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 check out the film um all right time to shift gears here (laughs) all right all right fun random questions uh Uh. Well, we uncovered a lot, and I think it's, yeah, uh, yeah I know it's going to be really helpful for, hey, you know, we appreciate everyone that listens, and I and I think there's, um, it's always interesting, someone that uses emotions in their craft to really help people kind of unlock some things, you know, and it's, and it's weird, your life, you know, how you live and what you shared, there's a lot of parallels for me, it's like, yeah, my faith and that support group that can call me on my shit first and foremost and, yep you know it's just it's interesting i'm always fascinated by it but anyways i could go on here's the fun stuff um three biggest inspiration and uh, inspirations acting wise oh leonardo dicaprio um hands down leonardo dicaprio i own every leonardo dicaprio film and i have a 2500 dvd collection um, although DVDs, DVD, you can barely even get a DVD player anymore. So yeah. I'm, I'm starting to get a little scared, but, <laughs> um, Leo for sure. Do you even have like growing pains box set when he was on? I, I don't, unfortunately, uh, I don't. Alex, every step of the every film, every film that he's been <laughs> in. Right. And I spent, I've spent seven hours in theaters, somehow in the last four days because i've seen killers of the flower moon twice already have you good stuff it's it's good it's good it's not it's it's not great but it is because it's very very long um it's very heavy but it it is good it is very well done it's very scorsese it it's very scorsese trying to make a Western look like a mobster movie. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Gotcha. Um, so it's, it, it's interesting. It's u- definitely unique. All right. I think my mother, um, uh, growing up, she was in major plays um, and just ex- an extremely talented actress. And, um, she'd probably, uh, kick my butt when I get home, if I didn't say that, but no, <laughs> um, I grew up watching my mom act and watching her, her performances and, and her method and, and how she prepared and, and that definitely is an inspiration. And then obviously the great Al Pacino, um, mm-hmm. being an Italian myself, and uh, you know, hopefully one day Randazzo will be on a list with Brando, Pacino, and De Niro. That's my hope. Right. Get it. So, Way to go, Alex. I'm proud of your kid. Hoo-ha. Right. Everybody does a Pacino accent. Yeah. And I like to do the quiet one. Everybody always does the the uh scent of a woman one. I like the more when he gets real quiet. Let me tell you a few things here. You know, that's when it's good, Pacino. All right. Um <laughs> You ever had a nickname? Uh my, my dad has ha, I have a nickname from my dad. Um but we'll 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 go with my nickname of the, um Razzle Dazzle from when I played hockey. 
Well, uh-huh. I'll leave my dad. My nick. My, my nickname with my dad is. We'll put that one. <laughs> right. Raz, uh, Razzle Dazzle was uh, um what I guess that's what they called my dad when he played hockey. It, it just rhymes with. It just rhymes with Randazzo, I guess. Yeah, no, I, hey, that's a good announcement. I hear it now, but, you know. Coming to the rink, Alexander Razzle Dazzle Randazzo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Hey, I'll tell you what my dad called me as a kid if you share yours. <laughs> or fuck it, I'll just share. So I loved Winnie the Pooh as a kid, so my dad called me Pooh Bear. But All then right, when my I- friends were around, it'd be like, what did you sh- like looking at me like I shit my pants at like seven or eight? It's like no. My dad called. My dad still to this day calls me Peanut. Like we we I remember we <laughs> used to play hockey like in men like high level men's hockey leagues, and I would hear Peanut pass the puck. I was like a nineteen year old man. <laughs> my dad yelling at me. Um. So yeah, Peanut was definitely my uh, nick, my childhood nickname. That, that was my son's first nickname, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's stuck. It, it it is. You still call him that or no? No, he won't let. No, he would. No, he'd wig the fuck out. No. Mm-mm. No. No. <laughs> well, I, I've tried, but my dad doesn't care. He loves it. So. <laughs> well, you know, talk about dad- that ego. That ego lowering. He just keep, keeps uh, keeps it. You know, keeps it in check. <laughs> Well, you know, here's your dad, former special forces, you know, me, you know, guy with red hair for Red Ribbon Week. I mean, come on. So that's like, you know, that's a little, a little bit of a different approach in life, probably. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Oh, I contemplate this more than probably most people should contemplate this. <laughs> um. I don't, I honestly change. So I, I don't know. I like the flash as a kid. So we'll go with, you know, fast, you know, super speed. Um, uh, it, Unless having the force, I'm a major, major Star Wars guy. Yes. Does having, does having the force count? Yes. I, I would have the force. Oh, dude, I'm with you on that. I'm a Star Wars nut. I build Legos for fun, and most of it is Star Wars. Like, dude, I, mean, I have in I the guess. other room. I have probably two, two to three hundred. I collect the the six inch action figures, two to three hundred of the, the the clone army. So I've got everyone from Ahsoka to Anakin to Rex to the five hundred first to uh, Cody. Every I've got three hundred of them in the other room. Well, that leads to my next question was going to be if you could be any one type of character in a movie or TV show, uh, but I wasn't willing to bet it would be, would you rather be a Sith or a Jedi? How about Anakin Skywalker, both? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Best answer ever. Right. We should. This is my last podcast on that answer right there. Just (laughs) both. Right. Oh, yeah. What a fun. uh, Ahsoka, you digging it? Uh, oh, I I loved I mean, I was watching it just for Anakin and I thought they did that that one episode. Spoiler alert. Sorry, everybody who hasn't seen it. But yes, loving it. Yeah, me yeah. too. Me too. I, you know, it's all you can put almost anything in the Star Wars universe and I'm going to check it out. Like, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. They had they, they had a few they had a, they dropped the ball a few times what you know yeah. a little early on but they've gotten it back they're they're get, get, getting it back slowly so yeah i mean and in the grand scheme did any of us really want to see boba fett be a good guy no no i don't no. think so I, he's supposed to like when 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 uh samuel jackson was gifted his lightsaber after revenge of the sith they engraved b a m f on the hilt um and that's what we wanted to see in boba fett too and why we you know we didn't want to see whatever whatever it is we got i don't yeah uh, no how could you not be angry you were a child and saw your father beheaded by a jedi i'm sorry there's just like Where's... And then you were recovered. You were saved by Tuscan Raiders, like the most br- brutal, like group group on Tatooine. And then you're gonna be nice to everybody. Yeah, 
No, yeah. should be under the thumb, like the yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. All right. Well, maybe. Hey, maybe we can end up writing something. Do you know Dave Floney? We let's try to get that meeting going here. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get a a pitch over to 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 Disney about Knights of the Old Republic. So. Oh. Okay. Hey, you get this made. I know we don't know each other. At least in the background, I want to carry a lightsaber once. I don't care if it's green, red, blue. Whatever it is, just once on camera, because I was going to ask if you had any like cool, like little bucket list things that you wanted to happen in your career. Mine still, I want to play a Jedi or a Sith, and I don't hey, care. I don't even need a line. That's that is mine too. That is that definitely is at the top of my list for sure. And then uh, I have a, a I want to remake a famous movie, but it, it, I want to I want to make a film about a famous guy. Um, hint, hint, shares my first name, who is a great, mighty conqueror, because the film that was made 20 years ago sucked. <laughs> so that's probably the, you know, making a an epic Alexander the Great movie at some point would be my, is really at the top of my list. So, yeah, and you're right. That movie royally sucked. <laughs> I just rewatched. I have, yeah, I have the like the final director's cut because they had cut, they had the theater cut, the director cut, another cut, and then the fourth cut, and it just got worse and worse. <laughs> and it just got longer. It's like the one I have is five hours long, and I think I'm just like, oh my gosh. But yeah, yeah. yeah that's not the answer. Like no. know, pe people that no. like them make it longer. Like, no, yeah. all right. Oh shit, Howdy. Uh all right, one last one because I very rarely get to talk with someone else that has much passion or more so than me about film and television and story making. Um, me, yeah. Uh two directors that you would love to work with. Christopher Nolan, hands down, without a doubt, Christopher Nolan. Um I think he is one of the I think he is the Spielberg of his generation. Um, Agreed. obviously Spielberg and Scorsese and, and, and Tarantino are, are all a generation or two before him, but I don't think anyone can touch him hands down, um, you know, in, in his generation. And then, uh, oh, let me think. I like, uh, Brad Furman, Brad Furman directed the Lincoln lawyer with Matthew McConaughey. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I I really enjoy a lot of his work as well. So um that those would probably be um probably be two two directors. Um yeah. yeah. Christopher Nolan. I agree with you, man, because I'm a huge Batman guy. That's my superhero. What's your favorite it, Batman? Christian okay, Bale. Good, good. good. Yeah. I was about to say uh, this this interview is over if you say anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Other than Christian Bale. Yeah. We're done. Podcast is done. I, now I grew up, of course, I'm, 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 I think I'm almost 20 years older than you, but, uh, so, you know, Michael Keaton was my childhood and it was great to see him in the flash. He was the highlight. I did enjoy I it. Even, I haven't even seen it. I just watched his clips on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was great. And I, and it, it, it I think the film gets a bad rap, obviously, for Ezra Miller and his actions. And hey, I understand that, but it was it was pretty damn solid in my opinion and fun. Okay. I left the movie and my girlfriend and I were like, that was fun. Like we had a good time. Like, like you know, there's not people... a lot of fun. There's and there's not a lot of fun movies anymore, you know. Yeah. At least that I, I haven't I haven't seen uh, you know. I haven't seen a lot of fun movies lately. So if, if that's the case, then then I'll check it out at some point here. Cause I just, yeah, just the, the, uh, the extra stuff around it is, is a little tough. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think with Christopher Nolan and what Christian Bale and that, the, you know, the cast in all three of the movies and the producers and the set people, everything that they did was, I was like, especially after the first one, I was like, Oh shit. I could see that happening once they made it feel so real. Like, you know, it, it was, it was set in the real world. And that was probably the first time. I think the only other movie, the only other superhero movie at all that pulled that off was the very first Iron Man, because then they started to weave in all the other stuff. 
but the very first Iron Man felt like it could be in the real world, but the Dark Knight trilogy, hands down, was like, oh, this is this could actually be happening right now, and it made sense. Now, yeah. if the question for you, okay, what rank rank the three? The Dark Knight, Batman Begins, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises. Dark Knight, Batman Begins, and then um, then the third one. Ah, ah. All right, that's that's everyone's ranking except mine. Um, but what do you go chronologically? I go backwards chronologically. Do you? I like the, I like the third one the most, which everyone tells me I'm nuts for, but um, I just I really enjoy number one. I love Tom Hardy, and oh, obviously yeah. I love Heath. Heath was phenomenal, but I don't think the fact that Tom Hardy with just his eyes gave almost as good of a performance as Bane that Heath Ledger gave as the Joker with just his eyes just blows my mind. Yeah. And, and, and I also, I'm a big conclusion guy. I love to get to the final episode of a, a murder mystery, you know, mini series or I like the conclusion where everything wraps up and I felt they did it. They did it really beautifully. And so it was probably more, it was a lot more moving for me when it ended. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I cried. I cried. Yeah. 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 I'll admit it. Yeah. 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 I, I was grateful they didn't give us a Sopranos ending. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> now, when I say that, I want you to understand, see how my fingers are completely together. Like it's that close with them. And I okay. waffle and I waffle because so I like the origins. I thought they did a like un, as opposed to every other Batman thing or superhero, they really dug into all the skill sets. So you get the whole picture of the and I love it. And I think I've loved ninjas since I was a kid. I mean, oh, yeah. I just, and Liam Neeson just yeah. nails it out of the park. Yeah, I mean, I got a fucking uh, the storm shadow snake eyes symbol tattoo from oh, G.I. Joe. Go. I love ninjas that much. Um, Are you still waiting for a good G.I. Joe movie then? Oh, they should let me write this. Uh, we can make it actually good. You know, you know what the best GI Joe movie is? That old animated one that that I used to watch growing up. I don't remember what it was called, but no, what? Yeah, GI Joe the movie. That's what it was called. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, the the last Transformers movie. Spoil alert, everybody, because <laughs> they tease at the end that they're gonna team up with GI Joe. So, really? yeah. That was the best part. I watched that whole movie just because somebody told me I'd really love the end. And I was like, oh, shit. OK, but they'll fuck it up, too. Uh, <laughs> they, yeah. they will. Yeah. They will. Um, but no, those are really, really close. I mean, Dark Knight, I loved because I love the for me, like that seller with the end was having all that spy technology and being able to in his mind, you know, I could see him justifying. But I'm doing this for protection. What we yeah. did in the United States, what we gave up for the protection. Patriot Act, yeah. yeah. And we gave up our privacy and that responsibility of that. When I see that and he blows up the computer at the end, it's like every time still gives me chills. I'm like, yeah, that and is why Batman's my right superhero. Now. Yeah, that's why he is my superhero. Hey, absolutely. And I, I also think the Dark Knight, out of the three, the Dark Knight gave the best intellectual philosophical look at what it means to be human and what it you know just the two different ships and pressing the button alone and watching the different people in the different arguments uh in the different discussions um in the joke you know the joker's final play there is uh, is just such a beautiful a tragic yet beautiful look at mankind because at the end of the day we still do the right thing. Yeah, agreed. And I and and I agree with you on Tom Hardy, very brilliant actor. Um, and I was in radio at the time, so this voice gave me a lot of material, <laughs> which I loved the voice. I thought it was great. I, I love you know, the voice too. Yeah, yeah. It gave me so I would like somebody would be like you know calling to win tickets. You just won tickets to see Kiss. Are you excited? It was a blast, <laughs> man. Lots of material. 
Uh, uh, man, this has been a real pleasure. I'm glad to connect with you. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm proud of you for not only wanting to put pen to paper on this film for stepping into the role. Like, like, dude, I just, I can't imagine that pre-filming preparation you went through and just a cast and crew. Um, you know, thank you for making a uh, lonesome soldier more, more, more people need to become aware of this issue. So Thank you very much. And this is where I leave the floor to you. Anything you want to add for people, maybe people struggling, drop a an anecdote, whatever it is, it's your time. Yeah, I, I just I want to thank you for for having me on. It has been the last hour. It's been awesome. I love to laugh. A uh, special laughter is the best medicine, especially after talking about, you know, such tough, tough subjects. And and I want to just you know, encourage anyone who's going through any sort of trauma or PTSD, just because you didn't serve and you're not a veteran, it doesn't mean that you don't have PTSD or your trauma isn't any less important than our service men and women and our veterans. Uh, this film is not just about our veterans and our service men and women. It is about the entire community. And in order for us to be able to help our veterans and servicemen and women who come back and currently still to this day don't get the help they need. We have to come together as a community. And I've found the most healing, the, the, the best way to heal from trauma is to help others heal from trauma and come together. And so I would just encourage anyone and everyone listening to this to Focus more on that community aspect of your lives, whether that be church, whether that be, you know, your high schools or your middle schools or your, you know, your your rec centers. And that would be my my encouragement at the end of the day, because without community, what what do we have these days? Alexander Randazzo, thank you very much, good sir. Appreciate you. And on that note, keep knocking doors down. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast, featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma, to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about.